is not so high because the, the, the scores of the index itself. So we can see that, for example, on the country here, we can see, um, oh my gosh, what am I doing? I'm sorry. Okay, here. Here, for example, we have Middle East, North Africa, and Pakistan country with low gender uh, scores component, but the index is higher because of the index of property rights itself. <coughs> and very interesting is to see down when we see upper middle income with better gender components of those countries, high income, no OECD. So what we are saying is that gender equality goes <coughs> close, but not always at the same pass of the index of property rights. And this is something that has to be also look with care because we have known or we have many other research that when you improve gender equality, especially you you increase, um, oh, how do you say that word, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, female participation in societies, you find uh, better and higher great rates of growth in the short term for those countries. So this is something to be seen uh, also carefully. And we've been talking, of course, of property rights closely related to economic performance. So here we have the average per capita income of the top 20% of, of our countries in the index, which is 24 times the, the bottom top, the bottom 20%. So here we can see a huge difference of what happened in that income. Of course, we, may, we must say that uh, well-being is a multidimensional concept is not only about economic performance. However, we are measuring it in economic, per, uh, in economic terms. So this is why I'm doing this comparison. And also, we are doing former analysis, for example, on GDP per capita. I will, we were talking uh, earlier about doing a more complex analysis of well-being, which is very difficult because only the definition of what means well-being is complex. Trying to figure out how to measure well-being is much more complex. However, it's interesting at least to begin to make some approach to that concept, in this case, in the, in, in the economic perspective. Here we, we run a correlation between the index and the GDP per capita. And we found a very strong and significant relationship between these two elements with a Pearson correlation of 0 0.8 and a coefficient of determination of 0 0.79. This gives us important hints of how related are these two elements, the property rights and the GDP per capita. Again, I, I understand that this is not a complex um, a concept of well-being, but is one approach to it. In the bottom graph, you have the same top uh, graph, but in this case, each dot, which is each country, is with its size of population. The big two circles you see there are China and India, of course, and you can see how it pulls down the average of the International Property Rights Index because they are in the middle bottom side of the total. And that's why I explained before, it lowers the average index. We also run the correlation with the component of the index and we found the same strong correlation with very high coefficient of determination, a second degree best fit curve. And Again, it's, it, it insists in the importance of the, uh, of the property rights and <coughs> economic growth, but not only property rights, generally speaking, with the three components, but the legal and political environment, the physical property rights, and of course, the intellectual property rights. I talked before about different ways of gathering grouping countries. Uh, we use the IMF, Region, World Bank, and I can use many others, like for example, uh, groups in different uh, economic agreements, and we did also. But then we decide, well, let's make the data speak. 
we don't want to have a pre, uh, preconcepted hypothesis of how they gather. Let's see how they gather. So we run a cluster analysis to make the uh, statistics say which countries are similar and cluster them in homogeneous groups. We use a word method for two system variability, a PCA to handle variables by factor, and what is so-called mobile center algorithm to, uh, to show the inertia between the groups. So the results that we got is that with three groups, we can explain perfectly our data, and we divided our countries in three, and these three clusters. We have 47 countries in the first one, 51 in the second, 50, 52 in the third one, and 30 countries in the third group. Malaysia is in the third group, by the way. Let me show this same analysis, but in a different way, this way. Each country is a dot, okay? You have the first cluster in red, the second cluster in green, and the third cluster in blue. You can see from bottom, from negative to positive, how they are uh, placed. And you see the size of the dot insists of in the, in the contribution in the inertia of the cluster. So you have that, for example, here at the bottom, you can see in red Haiti, which is the country that pulls down higher, uh, stronger, the cluster number one. Or you can see New Zealand or Norway, and of course Finland pushing up the first, the third group, the third class. You also have yellow dots. The yellow dots are what we call the centroids of the of the cluster. It's like the gravity center of each cluster. Is the like the average of them. And the closer you are to the to the centroid. Uh, the, close, the closer you are to be like an average of your group. So in the case of cluster number one, oh, I'm doing disaster, this is. In the case, I think it's this one. Yeah. Here you can see, for example, Iran, uh, here, Iran and Madagascar, which are the countries closer to the centroid of number of cluster number one, or the case of Romania, which is very, very close to the centroid of cluster two. The case of cluster three have a few of them, but more separated is the United States, France, and so on. The, also, the other one thing to, to, t uh, to look at here is which countries are in the borders of the two clusters because that means that you can change. You can go from one cluster to another very easily. So you can see, for example, Senegal and Russia, Russia, very close. So they are very similar. And it depends of what they do in the short term. And they can, for example, Senegal can go to cluster number two. Or Russia go back to cluster number one. Or the case of, for example, of Portugal, which is the closest to close, uh, it belongs to cluster three, but it's the closest to cluster two. And here you can see Czech Republic and Israel. We are really close to Portugal. Or for example, here we can see Malaysia. And very close, we can see Oman or Saudi Arabia. So we can see how far to the average of the country you are, uh, of the group you are. And how strong you are in your group. So this is a very important uh, information that this kind of cluster give us to us. Uh, let me check if I have another thing to tell you, but I'm sure I have, but I forgot. <laughs> the good point is that you are going to read everything which is in the website. And here we can, I can show you the same cluster, but now, trying to figure out how they were organized. For example, we see in cluster C are most of the OECD countries. In cluster one are the one of upper middle income and cluster one lower middle income. We can see that cluster two have the highest population, 4.2 million, uh, thousand million people, while the cluster three is the lower populated. 
you see, we can see European Union have, and here we have a group of countries organized by the uh, trade agreements. And we can see the European Union very close, uh, uh, participating in cluster three and cluster two. ASEAN countries are in cluster three, most of them, which is very interesting. And advanced economy are also in cluster three. So this is a way of looking to the groups by different kind of lens. Development, income, agreements they belong, population they have, and give us a more complex analysis of how groups are clusters, how countries are clusters. So from the analysis of the cluster, we can say that cluster one and cluster three are the two extreme poles. They will not touch each other easily. I mean, a country with one going to the other one will have to work a lot. But in the borders of the cluster, uh, close to cluster two, those movements can happen more or less easily. Um, I think that most is less, that is what I took up. And well, final remarks about the index in itself is that um, the index proves to be a valid instrument to evaluate the performance of nations. And of course, we are looking to the multidimensional improvement of welfare. We are looking here to the economic one. But I can show you other studies we've made and we found that those countries, especially with legal and political environment strong, they tend to behave and to give better well-being to their population. Also, results suggest that countries with high index score in, legal, uh, in, in property rights and also in its components show high income and high development indices. And the demographic perspective proves to be a very important one to look at the countries because it's not the same to look to a, such a big country like China, like a little one with little amount of population. We are doing all these analysis, trying to foster well-being. So it's fostering well-being not to countries but to people, and population is very important for that. And the cluster analysis also confirmed the important the importance of property rights as the classes gathered countries not only based on their property rights but also with a high degree of homogeneity, showing that the relevance of property rights <coughs> shaping society. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sari. Um, we have a request from the media to do a small uh, gimmick to <coughs> mark the launch of, the, uh, of the, the index. So before I go into more details uh, about the index, can I call Lorenzo and Sari again to the stage? And we just post for the media. Uh, sorry to everyone about this, but it's something that we just have to do. <laughs> Maybe we just call this. Can we change the slide back to the middle? Where do you want to Here? The photographers are making up their minds already. Over it.
<laughs> okay, put it. Sini. Right, okay. Sorry, sorry. I'm sorry everyone about this. Macam pretend macam tengah discuss lah sikit Thank you very much. I told you that you know we're very informal when we do all things like this. Even when we do the formal stuff, it becomes informal, right? Okay. Uh, right. Uh, what we're going to do next is to listen to uh, Ganesh uh, Muran. But I also want to to uh, let you know that Malaysia this year comes at number twenty-eight uh, in the index. The in within ASEAN, uh, Singapore is number one. And Singapore is number five globally. Uh, Malaysia is at number 28 out of the 129 countries. And uh, we retain the same position compared to last year. Last year we also at number 28. Uh, I think the uh, summary has already arrived, right? So you can just distribute to, to, to everyone. Uh, just now from the presentation of, of uh, Professor Sari Levy, uh, if you notice, she was showing you the, the different clusters, and that's quite an important information because cluster three is the more developed economies. And basically what uh, the data says is, if you want to go into that cluster, you want to become the more developed the economy, and you want to have a higher GDP uh, per capita, uh, you really should look after the, uh, you know, the regime, the, uh, the rules and regulations uh, around property rights protection. And it is not just about uh, you know physical rights. It covers three different things. So there's a legal and political environment that we must be concerned about. There is the physical property rights. There is also the intellectual property rights. And the difference is really stark. If you uh, remember from the presentation just now, the uh, top quintile, well, top 20 percent of the countries, GDP per capita is 44,542 US dollars. You go down uh, to the next 20%, uh, the GDP per capita drops to 23,786, and then you have 11,086, and the bottom one, the bottom 20% of the country's GDP per capita is only 1,880 US dollars per year. So it's, it's a very significant difference as you go up the, the ranking and you yes, you improve and become better at protecting the property rights. If you look at uh, the uh, list of, of countries uh, that are in the, uh, the top 10 uh, category in the, in the summary here, you will see it. And uh, I mean, we distributed the, the press release, you, you see it, yeah? The, the top 10 countries in the index are Finland, Norway, New Zealand, Luxembourg, Singapore, Switzerland, Sweden, Japan, Canada, and the Netherlands. And the bottom 10 countries in the index are Nigeria, Burundi, Zimbabwe, Yemen, Libya, Venezuela, Haiti, Angola, Bangladesh, and Myanmar. So immediately you can see, if you're planning your, your holiday, for example, you know, which uh, country are you thinking of going to, and, and it does make a difference. Uh, in, in terms of the quality of, quality of life and so on. And uh, th this is why, if you look at it from the ASEAN point of view, uh, we have a very wide-ranging, very different uh, sets of scores uh, within ASEAN. Singapore is number one. And Myanmar, which is at the bottom of the index, is also at the bottom of ASEAN, of course, is in ASEAN. Uh, so between Singapore and Myanmar, there's a very wide range. Malaysia comes second after Singapore, and then Philippines, and then Thailand, and then Indonesia, and then Vietnam, and then Myanmar. Uh, and the implication, if you, you want to know, you know, if I, I can just quickly indicate the potential implication of this. Say, for example, if you're a company, or you're, you're just a small uh, business vendor, or you're starting up your own business, Ganesh will tell you more about this. Just imagine you develop your IP, uh, 
a particular product in one country, say in Malaysia or in Singapore. You know, the biggest disaster that would, can happen to you if you are producing a product that is IP based, you know, a, a particular technology, a particular design, a particular product that, that is developed based on design. The biggest disaster that can happen to you is when you have the ASEAN economic community, there's free movement of goods between the ASEAN countries. You develop a product in Malaysia, it goes to Vietnam, immediately it's copied by everyone. That means you don't have a business anymore, right? Even though you're just starting up. Uh, and if you want to, to look at it from the physical property rights, this is even more stark because we are on the receiving end of this. Imagine a country like Myanmar where the physical property rights of uh, certain ethnic groups, especially the Rohingyas, are not respected even by the government and especially by the government. What do we have? We have refugees coming from Myanmar to Malaysia because their right to own the land and live in the land that they claim to own is not respected by people over there. You know, so th there is a, a, a really a clear implication to us in the country, not just from, from the business angle, but also from the human rights and social development as, aspect as well. So these are important issues that I think we need to bear in mind, and this is why we took the initiative to be part of this index, even though not many people in Malaysia now are talking about property rights uh, itself. It's not a very sexy topic to talk about, you know, it's very dry, it's very data driven, but the implication is huge. Just imagine if we do have respect on property rights, especially physical property rights, you know, effectively that means the government and other people uh, from, from countries like Myanmar should not be able to simply, you know, throw out uh, the, the, uh, the people from the Rohingya ethnic uh, group to become refugees in other countries. The implication is really big, but I don't want to, to dwell on that too much. I just want to indicate to you what the significance is and, and why it's important. Can I now call uh, Ganesh Guru to, to explain to us uh, about his company and uh, just to give a brief background before he does that. Uh, Ganesh uh, runs a company called Saura Industries. He's the founder of the company. He's a Malaysian innovative social enterprise that specializes in delivering safe and clean drinking water to rural and marginalized communities. Saura has innovated a proprietary, uh, uh, propri proprietary solar powered water purification system that is able to purify any surface water, river water, rain water, pond. He was telling me the other day that uh, he uh, uh, took sample water from uh, Sungai Klang right? yeah, and, and filtered that and you know, become clean drinking water. I have not I have not been brave enough to test that uh, in myself, uh, but that's what he's telling me. Um, the competitive advantage of Saura is their intellectual property they have developed proprietary nanotechnology that replaces the usage of UV light <coughs> to kill and eliminate bacteria and viruses. And the affordability of this new technology developed by Sarah makes it appealing and reachable to the poor, uh, including and especially those at the bottom of the pyramid. So can I invite uh, Ganesh to speak now? Thank you.
So this is my second time wearing formal, I think. First time was when I met once I fall. Uh, it's very hard to get an entrepreneur to wear formal because we're always in our jeans and t-shirt. Uh, first of all, thank you to Juan because he has been uh, mentoring me for quite some time and uh, I think we're going to have huge success with him from now onwards. So Saura is a company that I founded. Uh, basically, it built upon uh, this girl. Uh, so it was my final year project in engineering, so I thought as an engineer you have to do something that changed someone's life. And uh, if you don't do, then you're not an engineer. Uh, so what happened is I visited a village in Peninsula, and I saw that this girl basically was having diarrhea six times a week because the water was just very dirty. And uh, when I asked the family, the family was saying, hey, you know, maybe it was mosquitoes, you know, because they just don't know what was happening. And I came back to back to university and said, hey, you know, I'm going to build a system that basically is going to purify the water and I'm going to deliver it to her. Because uh, when I went to the village, I think it's, uh, my friends call me like the politician because when you walk with sweets and everyone follows you, you know, so you feel like a huge politician in the village. But uh, came back to university and I built a system. And uh, six, so the entire system took six months to build. Uh, I during my final year, uh, so I got an intern to work with me. So I paid him. I knew when I got him over to the company, I'm not, I, I won't be able to pay him. So at the end of the internship, I said, "Hey, you go my iPad. You know, that's the payment for your internship period." Uh, but the end of the six month, what happened was when I went back to the village, and she was no longer there because she passed away. Uh, and then that's when the company was built. Uh, so she's the foundation, she's the uh, inspiration of the company. Uh, it's not about me, it's about her. And uh, when, we, when I travel around in Malaysia, even in Sabah, in Malaysia, uh, safe drinking water is an issue. Uh, this is in Sarawak, whereby they use mountain water, which is uh, because of uh, logging uh, in the upstream. The water just gets polluted, and by the time it comes down, uh, it's, uh, it's undrinkable. So it is a global problem. Nearly a billion people in the world don't have access to clean drinking water. Every 20 seconds, a child dies. Uh, so after, after going back to the village, three months, I was so uh, frustrated. I said, hey, you know, I'm not going to do this anymore. Because the thing is, when you go back, and you find that your inspiration is no more there. And basically, I, parked this, I put this system that I built in the storeroom and said, hey, I'm not going to do this anymore because it's so frustration, frustrating to see this happening. And when March arrived, when uh, March 2013 or 14 uh, came, and uh, we got invited to present in a competition in NASA itself. That's when it all started off again. And the mission of the company is basically to touch and uplift lives to technology. We don't want to have long-winded vision for missions that even the company staffs don't remember. At the moment, we provide clean and drinkable water that is economically and environmentally sustainable to rural and marginalized communities. We established in August 2014. We did our first project in June 2015. The company name is Saura Industries. Saura, uh, what happened is when every time when I visit the village, uh, basically, uh, Saura means uh, like what what for her for the girl for Mira. She calls her parents Saura, means, means someone who feeds her, someone who takes care of her, someone who gives her, uh, provides everything that she needs. So Saura was built because uh, she kept on saying the name. So, And uh, we have a patent pending technology uh, for water purification. Basically, it took us two and a half years to build the technology. Uh, first time when Juan asked me, hey, you know what do you think of IP? And I told him that, hey, uh, if you're going to go grow fast, then don't think about IP. But you want to grow far, then you think about IP. So that's why it is quite an, uh, a very long process itself. IP, I, I don't, it is not a very pleasant process of, as well, uh, applying for it, because you have to keep on going. I think in Malaysia, it's much more tougher compared to the other countries. Uh, so we've deployed and tested it in Malaysia. Uh, we certified by SGS, uh, international body, uh, we have Stanford uh, testing the unit. Uh, we have two professors in Stanford also uh, working on a grant on this. So we have two PhD students under two professors who's working on improving the technology itself. Uh, we certified by University of Philippines, Ateneo de Manila. We've proven to effectively.